at the start. Um, as usual, can all phones be switched to silent or off, please? And when people are presenting, if you can be as close to the microphones as possible. These are actually better, I think, than the previous uh, microphones that we had, so people in the public gallery can hear us. Um, it's always a sad duty when we have to do this. Can I um, start the meeting uh, by expressing the great sadness of the passing of Carol Hudson, CBE, who is the Chief Executive of Hudson Talon's Council from 1991 to 2015. Carol was instrumental early in, uh, I think worked very closely with Phil and, and others here, um, with the establishment of the Combined Authority, and we're thankful for the dedication that she gave. Um, on that note, can we uh, pass on our sincere condolences to her family, friends, and work colleagues, and as normal, can I ask you to join me in a minute silence as a sign, sign of respect? Just to thank you very much for for uh, Collins for that uh, a gesture of, uh, of, uh, of remembrance of, of Carol. Um, uh, she was an enormous uh, uh, force for good, um, not only in St Helens but as you say across the city region. Um, uh, there will be a public commemoration uh, for her in January, and we will circulate information around to colleagues so they can attend. But thank you very much for that. Um, can we um, have any apologies, Sri? Apologies have been received from Joe Anderson and Luciana Berger, MP. Any further apologies? No. Um, declarations of interest is for members. Item three is the minutes of the uh, meeting of the Combined Authority on the 16th of November and subject to the inclusion of Lynn Collins, who is the chair of FASJAP, being in attendance, can the meetings meet can the minutes of the meeting of the Combined Authority, which is included in pages one to six, be agreed please? Agreed. Item four uh, is an update. Um, obviously other than Paul McCartney visiting Liverpool again uh, and um, a fantastic evening was had by all, uh, I think I remember. Uh, I'll start with Brexit and I think that it's a week in which Westminster has shown that pantomime season really has started, it's very much in swing down there. Um, here in the city region, however, preparations to ensure that we're as ready as we can possibly be for whatever comes out of Brexit uh, are already proceeding at pace. So last week I had discussions with Ministers from the Department for Exit in the European Union, and I've got the opportunity to stress to them how important the EU is as a city region and one of our major trading partners. And we'll see um, some of the results in that relationship in the funding announcements later on in the agenda. Um, in fact, for also over 60% of the exports from the city region are with the EU. Some of our major industries, including chemicals, Automotive have strong supply chains with France and Germany. I also had the opportunity to express my concern at the Treasury's own analysis, which shows that the current deals and the four options uh, that are on the table, um, none of which are in any way positive for the city region or, in fact, the UK's economy. So myself and Asif Hamid, who's the portfolio holder for Brexit in Brussels. I therefore asked the CA officers, working with the LEP and of course our local authority partners, 
to step up preparations with government for all scenarios, including a no deal scenario. Um, we had a fantastic uh, get together with uh, Anand um, a few weeks ago, and really he spelt out what the dangers are for areas like ours. And I think it's also vital that whatever the future holds in relation to Brexit, we as a city region need to demonstrate that we're open for business on a global stage. So with um, the uh, confirmation from the leaders of mayors, uh, we've committed to the city region hosting an international business festival in 2020 following the successful event that we had in 2018. Um, again, another sign that says that we're open for business. And the tender is currently being prepared for a third party to deliver the festival on our behalf and there's going to be more details on that in the new year. Uh, this morning, Delighted to announce that the tender for the new Mersey ferries has been posted and this is the start of the procurement process in which bidders are encouraged to recognise the importance of their bids to our local economy. And it marks the start of the next chapter in the, the ferry's long and illustrious history. Um, the current fleet is sorely in need of an upgrade, um, nearly 60 uh, years old and that's um, older than some people in this room. And uh, it's as much about safeguarding our beloved ferries for future generations as it is about improving and enhancing the customer experience. So the combined authority will be asked to commit to the project's delivery once the procurement process is completed and a preferred supplier is selected. So we'll come back here for uh, approval. And for the time that it takes to complete the procurement process, um, which is influenced by a whole host of different factors, and uh, not least by how many bids we get, we'll mix it and then we expedite that as quickly as possible. And that process, just to let people know, it involves in-depth conversations with bidders and the detailed examination of paperwork, obviously, uh, which will mean that the more bidders that we get, the longer that this will take. But what I can assure members is that we'll be working effectively and efficiently to select a preferred supplier as soon as it's practically possible. And that's without, of course, any predetermination. Uh, people will have seen, hopefully, the report, um, which is an independent report, which found that what was called Liverpool's dream, in other words, the third visit of the Giants, um, brought 1.3 million visitors to Liverpool city region, so to Liverpool and to Wirral, and generated 60.6 million pounds for local economies. And just for the avoidance of any doubt, um, Wirral's proportion of that doesn't end up in Phil Davis's budget that he can spend uh, next year. The report further validates the decision that we made to combine the authority to invest five million pounds <coughs> into the 2018 cultural projects. And I think further than the lines, the great work done by the staff from Mersey Travel, from the Liverpool and Wirral Councils, who were involved in the organisation of what turned out to be an absolute um, spectacular. In particular, I'd like to pay tribute, though, and I'm sure uh, this is um, from all of us here, to the hundreds of volunteers who gave up their time to make that whole weekend, a long weekend, such a special event. Um, whilst we've said 60.6, million pounds. That's the tangible outcome. The intangible ones are the amount of people who came into the city region, who went to New Brighton for the first time ever, who said they're going to come back. So there was an analysis done on that as well. And from the outsiders, 97% um, of people said that they would return to the Liverpool city region. Absolute staggering, isn't it? So the more we do these sorts of things, the more people come into the city region, see that it's got a wide offer, they'll come back and they'll spend that money in the economy, so um, really good news for us. And just finally, I want to touch on the situation at Camelhead. Um, again, I visited the picket lines with um, Councillor Davis, uh, where we had the opportunity to speak, not just to the conveners and some of the, the workforce, but also to the owner, John Sibley. Um, people have seen that Camelhead didn't say the HR1 notices last week, um, and what's um, happened is that we've been asked to set up a task group which is chaired by Mayor Joe Anderson, um, includes some of the leaders, uh, and that's to look at all the options in regard to the issues at the yard. Some of them are structural, 
Um, it doesn't in any way abrogate the responsibility of government to bring forward the Royal Fleet Auxiliary contracts as quickly as they possibly can. But um, I think local leaders are all um, trying to engage to see whether there's anything more that we can do. We will literally bend over backwards to secure the future of that yard. Um, we, um, we do need the government to step up, and that will be one of the, the major asks, um, because uh, we do not believe that they currently do as much as they possibly can, but we'll keep everybody informed of progress on that. And then finally, despite some debate, today is the anniversary of 100 years since women first voted. Uh, events are going to take place across the whole Northwest to commemorate the day with two statues uh, being unveiled today. So Emmeline Pankhurst in Manchester and Annie uh, Kenny in Oldham um, here in the Liverpool City region. <coughs> Earlier this year, after a campaign by the TUC Women's Committee, a blue plaque was unveiled to Jeannie Mole, a trade union and women's rights campaigner in Bolt Street in Liverpool. Um, again, I think there's a lot more that we can do to commemorate some of those social advances that have been made by women in our city region and I'm sure everybody will be looking at opportunities to do that. So today's obviously a hugely significant historical date. It's also a reminder that in a whole range of issues from equal pay to representation in senior leadership roles, there's still so much more that we need to do as a society and um, hopefully with our inclusive um, growth and uh, equal um, opportunities and uh, our social values and social impact um, uh, policies will be held to be held up as an exemplar across the, the whole country. So thank you for that. Um, item five um, is a report on an update of the progress on the Mersey Tidal project and Councillor Powell is going to take us through this report. Thanks Mr Mayor. The report provides a progress update for the Mercy Tidal project and requests additional budget to the value of £850,000 for phase two. The progress since the last of this has been focused on engaging the key stakeholders, securing internet, internal project resources and planning for phase two. Procurement for external advisors to support phase two is now underway and the CA plans to complete the section selection process and appoint external advisors in February next year. The scope for activities for phase two would be developed of a detailed outline business case following the Green Book appraisal process that will establish the viability of the options to deliver a Mersey Tidal Energy project. To support these activities there is an additional budget request of £850,000 to forecast, the forecast cost for the phase two was £1.2 million. Minus the forecast balance for the current budget of 350,000 leaves a gap in funds of 850,000. The internal and external resource secured will result in a high quality outline business case that can serve to make future investment decisions. Phase two findings are forecast to report to the CA in early next year. We move the recommendations, Mr. Mayor. Thank you, Councillor are there any questions in regards to that report? Okay, um, Jill, do you want to come in? Yeah, thanks for that report, Mark. Um, I just wanted to know what the thinking was into the entire project and being able to understand and address its potential environment impacts and benefits. Thanks, uh, thanks Mr. Uh, our priority is to understand, minimise and mitigate the impacts whilst maximise the beneficial environment or any kind of opportunities created. The reference case for the project focused on the potential for an offshore tidal lagoon. This could create one of the largest clean energy power plants in the world. This volume of clean, predictable local source energy would have a transformational effect on the city region strive to reach zero net carbon by 2040. It could meet a large percentage of the city region's energy demand, not just for power, but also for mobility. Heat and industrial, industrial energy is linked into an energy system including offshore wind and hydrogen. The ability to supply large volumes of renewable power not only helps meet our climate change goals, but it is increasingly important differential a differentiator for power dependent sectors such as digital and mobile providers, mobility providers. 
The Mersey Estuary and the Liverpool Bay are both recognised as areas of environmental significance and sensitivities. The tidal nature of both areas provides a special ecosystem that is both delicate and interlinked. The protection and coexistence of the ecosystem has been a key priority since the inception of the town project. Our off-the-lot research will be committed to understanding how the large-scale town power project could be designed, installed and operated in such special environments. We hope we'll get more about when we think on uh, phase two. Chair. Thanks for the question, Councillor Wood. Um, just to, to supplement uh, what Councillor Powell said there, what we always have to ask, isn't it, in regards to environmental considerations and concerns, is what happens if we don't do this? Um, do we just continue to smash the ground a bit to, to frack for, for gas um, and polluting the, the groundwater, etc., etc.? This is the only way I think that, as a city region, we're going to be able to reach our carbon neutral targets by 2040. So it's really important as a project to us. Are there any further questions, Councillor Wood? Thanks for the details in that, Rob. Um, I wanted to know then, a little bit you said, with the project being reviewed, have any local successful marine or energy projects, um, are there any lessons that can be learned? Has there been anything identified? Thanks, Joe. Um, and thanks for giving us a heads up on this. Um, obviously, the city region has developed a strong track record over recent years in developing systems that have allowed large scale infrastructure projects to be successfully delivered in the Mersey and Liverpool Bay. In the last five years, the Mersey Gateway Bridge, the Liverpool Container Terminal and Burberbank Wind Farm, have all demonstrated that it is possible to maintain and support our marine ecosystems before, during and after construction. We are capturing the lessons learned from these projects to apply to our tidal project. We are fortunate to have some of the world's leading research centres dedicated to the main environment here in the city region and we are already engaged with the National Oceanographic Ocean Oceanographic I won't I can't say that. Uh, <laughs> and the Institute of Sustainable Coast and Oceans and, and they are and they will provide an invaluable support to the project. Thanks so much. The National Ocean Oceanography <laughs> Centre or or as we both should have said, knock. <laughs> That's the one. Um, you, you're right, we, we've had a number of projects and, and all of those lessons will be captured in uh, the report that eventually comes to us. This is not going to happen overnight, this is uh, just the latest stage in the iteration to get to where we need to get to, which is to persuade government of the business case for a tidal project. Um, are there any other questions? If not, um, are the recommendations set on? Page seven in the report agreed. Six is um, the report seeks approval to accept a total of ten million three hundred eight thousand two hundred sixty pounds ERDF funding from the Sustainable Urban Development Fund. And Councillor Robinson is going to take us through this report. Yeah, thanks for that. Um, really pleased we're bringing this paper forward today because we're seeking approval to spend some uh, European Union money, some ERDF uh, cash, and I think it's always a suitable opportunity just to remind ourselves of what a good friend the European Union has always been to this city region. And it's particularly been an exceptional friend to our transport network. Yeah, when you look at, there's large numbers of stations on the Mersey Rail network that have been refurbished using EU cash previously. Actually, some of them have been built from scratch with European grants. Uh, on the bus network, locations like Queen Square bus station were funded by the European Union and some of our ferries assets, particularly things like the pontoons, have been funded by the European Union. So very much with those kind of significant uh, heritage um, and projects in mind, I think what we're bringing forward here are equally transformational uh, opportunities because we seek to spend uh, as you rightly pointed out, just over £8 million pounds of the RDF cash. Um, some of that, uh, almost £2 million, pounds, will go towards uh, the new Mersey Ferry, uh, particularly focusing on making sure that that uh, vessel uh, is going to be a low emission uh, vessel, so it will be really focusing on the quality of the technology in the engine. Uh, but just as transformational, we're going to be spending just over £8 million pounds on a significant upgrade and improvement to recycling and walking 
in our city region as we are looking to develop 55 kilometres of new segregated uh, cycling infrastructure with an accompanied 49 hectares of green space uh, around all of that infrastructure. Genuinely, I think that gives us a great opportunity to develop a cycling superhighway network across our city region. There's an appendix in your papers which shows uh, the map of where we'll be covered, but the fact that people in the future, by 2021, when all of this is rolled out and developed, will be able to ride their bikes from Speak to Southport, from Prescott across Silver Jubilee Bridge to Buncombe, from Seacombe Ferry Terminal to Liso, and large parts across St Helens as well. It really gives us a great opportunity to embed cycling and walking within our transport network. So really pleased to be bringing forward these recommendations and looking forward to having the support so we can get out and roll it out on the network. And, and again, just to supplement what um, Councillor Robinson has just said, part of this process will be about um, better engaging those people from the cycling community in what those plans will look like and I've made that a, a public commitment today. Um, are there any questions? Yeah, Rob. Just about this, this is good news, isn't it? Because I know in my local authority, we we gone some years ago before the austerity hit in about doing um, cycleways, etc. And some of them are now falling into disrepair, and you have to take a priority list, and so they fall down the pecking order. This hopefully will will uh, will bring that up to scratch. If we're all together doing stuff like this, it should be as you say. I mean, be able to ride your bike from Southport right through across the bridge, so it's really good news, I welcome it. Yeah, absolutely, I sort of wholeheartedly uh, agree. I pick up on both the point you made, Steve, on the question, Rob, in the sense that we are going to make sure that what we design and deliver is with sort of stakeholders and bike users in mind, and actually the first meeting of that grouping is only on Monday when we start getting into the nitty gritty of what we look to design. But absolutely, this is about recognising what our priority, particularly in the low carbon and air quality agenda, this is all about. Because making sure that uh, cycling and walking isn't just something that you're able to do, but it's attractive to do, is absolutely a key part of our low carbon future. So I hope that what we're putting down here is the sort of starting point of future network expansions that really embed sustainable transport into how we get around the city region. Councillor Long? Thank you, thank you, Mayor. Um, obviously, welcome news. Uh, I'm particularly delighted that we're looking at 6.3 kilometres of uh, better cycling paths in St Helens. Uh, even more delighted that there's uh, eight hectares of habitat being supported, which is reinforcing our commitment to uh, green spaces within St Helens. So that's all delightful. Uh, yeah, Liam, in terms of uh, the relationship between this and other parts of your portfolio, Will this contribute to improving our air quality uh, within the city region? Yeah, without a shadow of a doubt, because the more people that are travelling sustainably, but particularly on their bikes, uh, is more likely that they aren't going to be in private cars. And that's what this all boils down to, because it is literally zero emissions when you're on a bike. This is a key part of how we tackle our air quality challenges in the city region. Um, Jane? <coughs> Thank you, Mayor Arthur. Um, can we be told a little bit more about how this will help road safety overall? We still have <coughs> worryingly high numbers of people who are killed and seriously injured. Very often they are cyclists, but often pedestrians as well. How will the we how, how will this plan actually help keep pedestrians safe? And particularly when you know that it is the lower income. Um, areas where there, there are people who are less able to afford a car, who we would want to help to use a bike, but at the moment it's too dangerous. Um, if, we, if you could say a little bit about how this plan will help those parts of the region, uh, I would be uh, really pleased to hear it. No, those are really, really important points. And on a personal note, as a keen local cyclist, I know just how challenging parts of our kind of road network can be when you're on your bike. Uh, so one of the key things that this will be embedded is the fact that large amounts of this will be segregated network. Yeah, you will be separated from the rest of the road 
uh, traffic. Obviously, we want to make sure that what is delivered is genuinely usable. That's why uh, we're engaged not just with district partners, but a variety of different cycling groups to make sure that what we actually put in place on the ground is genuinely what people want to use. And if you have those segregated cycle lanes uh, past the Blackpool right the way through County Road um, and the Strand, I'll get back on my bike. I'm a lap cyclist, so um, I was taking my life into my hands, and that's why I think this is really good news because it's a very, very serious issue, isn't it? If you're a cyclist, um, our roads are not designed in many instances because of the Victorian infrastructure for cycles. Uh, we can't do everything, but I think this is a really good first step. Um, I think we have um, Councillor Morgan. Uh, thank you, Chair. Um, I welcome this report and, and Councillor Robinson's comments as well, and I know that you put a lot of dedication and hard work into this. Just from a nosery point of view, the, um, the press got to Runcorn uh, and make uh, £1.5 million pounds to be invested to make 7.4 kilometres of new cycles and path uh, walkways, which is really welcome. And it can be supported by nine hectares of, of habitat. But not only for me, though, that's from a nosy point of view, as I said, it's kind of goes through some of the most beautiful scenic parts of the city region for me, which is Target, Cronton, and over to the Silver Jubilee Bridge. So this is a fantastic opportunity, and I think it's a, a safe one as well, from the point that Jane was making as well. And then in the future, will it be a fantastic opportunity that you'll be able to jump on your bike on this route, cycle up to Prescott? Park your bike up and go to the new Shakespeare Theatre <laughs> and, uh, and then get back on your bike and go home on a safe route. So I welcome this report, yeah. Thank you. Well done, you getting Shakespeare into that one. Um, <laughs> other other things yeah. are available in the city region. <laughs> If we're going to do that, of course, and we, we, you've just mentioned the Silver Jubilee, Jubilee Bridge, of course, we've invested heavily in that, I think nearly up to £10 million, which ha does have um, segregated cycle lanes on that bridge. So again, it, it is all starting to come together. We can't do this overnight, it's not a magic wand, but it's the start of a process, I think, which really will start to address many of the concerns, certainly from the people outside that I spoke to this morning. Um, we've got. Um, uh, Councillor Davis. Yeah, um, well, I would like to welcome this uh, pr proposal as well, and particularly from uh, a rural point of view, the uh, 617,000 being invested in the Liso to Seacombe Ferry Terminal, um, two, two quite deprived communities in rural, uh, and I, I welcome uh, improving the, the cycling and, and walking uh, links between those two communities. And also, of course, Seacombe Ferry Terminal is the location of the, the will be location of the new Eureka National Children's Museum. So, um, you know, I welcome uh, you know any enhancements to uh, enable people to to get to what will be not just a wonderful visitor attraction um, and learning uh, sort of centre for Wirral, but for the whole of the city region. So this is. This is great news, and I hope we can get the communications out to uh, you know to explain to people the the opportunities this will create. So re really welcome this report. Thanks, Chair. Uh, Natalie. Thank you, Chair. This is a really um, great um, move forward, not only in terms of air quality, but looking at getting people out and active in terms of <coughs> reducing obesity, depression, and other health. Um, condition. So this is a really positive way forward and uh, I welcome this report and I look forward to the development. Any last comments, Liam? I think just um, if you could um, explain how all of these bits are integrated in regards to public transport and the neuron and stuff. Yeah, absolutely. No, I'll make a few kind of points because I think Phil's point is particularly really poignant about how he will the infrastructure on the world will link in with the um, new Eureka Museum and how fantastic that's going to be. Because I think one uh, of the great things we hope this can help achieve is make sure that more kids and more kind of families actually engage in, in cycling. And I'm very proud of the fact that our city region still has the largest programme of bikeability uh, training for kids in our schools, giving them the cycling proficiency to ride their bikes safely around our area. But I think this really gives an opportunity to take that on to the next level. Natalie's points about kind of health and well-being are absolutely um, absolutely key to all of this. We know just how much a challenge we've got with air quality, 
but obesity equally is another great challenge uh, for our city region. We shouldn't overlook some of the challenges of uh, mental health as well. And one of the campaigns that's running at the moment is the Arrive Happy campaign, really kind of pointing out about how if you walk, but particularly if you get on your bike, not only are you healthier and fitter, but actually mentally you feel much more prepared for whatever you're going or whatever you're going to be doing. So that well-being element is a key part of it. And then finally, absolutely, this has to be about an integrated uh, approach. And one of the ways in which uh, we see there's an even greater potential for cycling and walking is linking to the wider public transport network, and particularly the brand new fleet of trains uh, that we'll be introducing on the Mersey Rail network. The first one will be with us this time next year into testing. Um, but as part of the design of those trains, because they're publicly owned by ourselves, we can specify what is best for our region. Uh, we've had local cyclists actually designing cycling facilities on those trains. So it really is part of an integrated vision of how we persuade people out of cars, onto bikes, walking, onto buses, onto trains as well. Excellent. Can we therefore agree the recommendations are set out on page 15 of the report? Okay, seven is the appointments to the Transport Committee and the report seeks approval of the appointment of Councillor Doc Johnson from Nosley Council who's to replace Councillor Norman Keats on the Transport Committee. Is that agreed? Great. Eight is the draft committee timetable. It's really just for noting, but i um, happy to answer any questions. Does anybody have any issues? No? Um, can we agree the draft committee timetable for 2019-20, please? Great. Item nine is public question time. We have received one question from Councillor Tom Crone, so can I invite Councillor Crone to address the meeting? Thank you, Mayor. Uh, my question is, to keep global temperature increases to below two degrees centigrade above pre-industrial levels, there must be an absolute global cap on the amount of carbon dioxide that humanity can emit in the future. Has anyone calculated the limit on how much can be emitted by the Liverpool City region to make its fair contribution to the Paris Agreement commitment of ensuring global temperatures increase by less than 2 degrees centigrade? If not, will the combined authority commit to undertaking this analysis to ensure carbon reduction plans are made with robust science-led targets? Thanks for the question, and, and this does fall under Councillor Paul Hill's um, pair of views, so can I ask um, Councillor Powell if he wants to respond? Yeah. Thanks, Mr. Mayor. And thanks. Can I thank Councillor Cole for raising this important issue? Uh, tackling climate change and protecting our environment is a key priority for the combined authority. As a city region, we are blessed with some unique, asset, uh, unique natural assets, including our river and coastline, which give us the potential to be the cleanest and greenest city region in the country. The UK government has agreed the national target to reduce carbon levels by 80% by 2050 compared to 1990 levels as part of its commitment to tackle emissions from greenhouse gases. In addition to this, the Liverpool City region's ambition is to be zero carbon by 2040. Many current work programmes by the Combined Authority will make a positive contribution to carbon reductions and in tackling climate change. These include the Mersey Tidal Power Commission, supporting wind and solar power, exploiting the potential for hydrogen engines and reducing emissions from buses and ferries. We are also looking at further projects which could, which could reduce emissions as part of the Transforming Cities Fund. In relation to the specific study he mentions, I have asked combined authority officers to examine the issue further and provide a full response to, to you within the 10 working days. And Councillor Cohen, just to add, um, I would refer you to a number of documents and strategies that we've already got in the city region. Um, the title paper, the subs paper that we just had, uh, stuff about the rolling stock, uh, the air quality task force that we've got, but all of these are focused on reducing emissions. And I just would say that I think we're the only area in the country uh, where we all have photovoltaics, we've got solar, We've got uh, a massive offshore wind farm. We've got hydrogen capture. And I don't know whether people were aware of the announcements the week before last, I think it was, about the first hydrogen train 
being manufactured in the Liverpool city region. Um, we've also got um, uh, the potential to harness the power of the River Mersey. We really can become Britain's energy coast, and I think it's good what we're doing. And I understand the reasons uh, behind the question. I think it's an excellent uh, question. We're doing what we can, and I think the stuff about environmental concerns is something that needs to be tackled at a um, country and um, at even global level. But we're doing more, I think, in our city region than most other areas combined. I'm more than happy to take a supplementary. So I accept everything you say, and you've uh, highlighted several positive projects that are happening. But it would be completely possible to invest in all these things to improve the rolling stock, to increase renewable energy, to invest in tidal energy. You could have all these projects, and they could all, in and of themselves, be good things. But if we do nothing to tackle other sources of carbon emissions, we could easily emit far too much carbon whilst doing all those good things. So the idea of carbon budgeting is to say there is an absolute limit on what we can emit. If we go beyond that, the science says that we are contributing uh, more than our fair share towards the possible climate breakdown that the planet faces. So I believe that rather than focusing on, as well as focusing on individual projects that will have a positive impact, we should say what are our absolute, what is our rock bottom, what can we not go beyond as a city region. And then we've got a really serious thing to focus on so that overall we can be sure that we do our bit to, to avert global climate breakdown. Um, I think we're probably all in agreement with the talent here, um, but we will get you a, a detailed response within 10 working days. Thanks very much for the question. Okay, we're on to um, item 10, which is um, petitions and statements. Really? No petitions and statements. Um, 11 is um, confirming the minutes of the Transport Committee held on the 1st of November 2018, please. Um, and as this is the last meeting, of course, of, of this particular year, may I wish everybody a happy Christmas and all the best for 2019. I just need to point out that um, myself and the leaders aren't the Grinches. Some of them have gone some way, Council Mayor's tight, for instance, to, um, to, to, to add socks. <laughs> yeah, not normal things that we would see, really, um, but... The, um, there, was a, there was a request that we did where something, and if we didn't, that we contribute to, um, I think it's State Children Fund. There's a collection point at the front here. I think uh, all the leaders have now contributed. If you haven't, you need to. Uh, anybody else who wants to make a contribution, I'm looking at Chief Executives and the Police and Crime Commissioner, who, oh, she's got to go. Some of us wore something Christmassy and contributed. <laughs> Indeed. Yes, church, all of it's not an item. <laughs> Some of us. <laughs> yeah, the Royal We. Um, so it's not bar humbug. We um, we will raise some um, funds for children in need. Um, hopefully, see everybody safe and sound next year. Um, thanks a lot for attending. It's fair. It's fair. Point of order. <laughs> Sorry. Point of disorder. <laughs> Can you certainly ban things? <laughs>